Hello and welcome to episode 22 of the Cloud Computing for the C-Suite show with Brad Nelson and internationally recognised and world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. This week we're excited to have as our special guest Katrina Dow. Katrina is the founder and CEO of Miko, a world leading data independence startup in the emerging personal data economy. Katrina speaks globally globally on privacy and data innovation and currently serves on two IEEE standards working groups, co-chair of the Personal Data and Privacy Committee, which is part of the Global Initiative for Ethical Considerations in the Design of Autonomous Systems and the chair for the new P7006 standard for personal data artificial intelligence agent. Hi Katrina, hi Dave, a warm welcome to you both. It's exciting to have you on the C-Suite show this week. Hi Brad, hi David, thank you for having me. Hey, Katrina. It's good having you on as well. Good to see you, Brad. As always, it's a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thanks, Katrina, for coming on. Really uh, appreciate your time. In this week's show, we will be talking about what will GDPR change in the terms of what the C-suites are considering in terms of cost versus privacy. Over to you, Dave. Yeah, ultimately, this is something that I hear about a lot uh, from the C-suites because they, they have to deal with privacy issues, either regulatory issues or actually a lot of policy-based privacy. So in other words, the way in which they're defining privacy um, for the company and, and defining how they're protecting their customers' data, you know, those sorts of things. And there's a cost associated with that when you deal with encryption, especially when moving into the cloud, you're dealing with encryption services, you're dealing with identity access management, different, different uh, you know, uh, you know through, two-factor authentication and all this stuff that kind of comes into play to ensure that people's, you know, data won't get lost and breached and all the, you know, bad things that have occurred over the last, uh, you know, three or four years in terms of these mega breaches that have occurred. And so ultimately this comes down to a risk versus um, reward. So if there's a risk in terms of losing data and having your customer's data privacy breached and having to deal with all the issues around that, um, how much is that worth to the company? And is it okay to go ahead and take a higher risk if we're not necessarily dealing with the impact that we're, we're going to deal with in terms of losing or, or violating someone's privacy? And also if we're not regulated or we're not in a regulatory compliance area like HIPAA and GDPR and some of the things that are coming down the line, is this something that we need to pay attention to? So it's, it's really getting into the business aspect of privacy. It's getting into the fact that I don't want to spend as more money than I need to to protect my information. I don't want to spend more money than I need to to in order to be compliant with the different regions that I'm in. So it's GDPR in Europe and some of the Chinese regulations that are popping out and some of the privacy issues that are, that are coming in, in Australia. So Katrina, I'd, be, I'd love to hear kind of your aspect of this. So how you would advise people to deal with the trade-off? Obviously, I can't spend a billion dollars on data privacy because that's going to break my company. But I need to spend enough where I'm going to basically protect the uh, uh, data privacy requirements of my users and also the regulatory requirements, whatever regions I'm operating in. Thanks, David. Look, I, I think there are there are a number of really important points that that you've just raised, and 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 I think one of the big challenges right now in the C-suite is um, whether or not it's HIPAA or whether or not it's um, uh, services to children uh, um, or whether it's GDPR whether or not it's open banking, um, the compliance requirements are now, they're this year. And so the, the, the pressure right now is, is to build that compliance into um, existing business practices as quickly as possible. But if we step back from that, I think there are really three strategic um, uh, requirements for any C-suite right now. And the first is, what's our business model? What's our long-term business model? If we're moving to an omnipresent, 24-7 AI-connected world where, you, where data is being exchanged moment by moment, you're authenticating or authorizing access to services, what's the core model of our business? Are our customers the product and are we monetizing their behavior? Or do we have a strong value proposition to be enhancing um, the lives of our customers, and therefore we can differentiate through the way that we make the So I think the first thing is, what's the business model? 
then that I think starts to help start looking at this issue between the tension from a regulatory point of view between cost and privacy. And we've already started to see this um, kind of uh, a splinter in the press over the last few weeks where Apple has come out and, and take a very direct aim at companies like Facebook and, and Amazon AWS and, and called out the difference of their, of their um, data practices. We've had Microsoft start to, about two months ago, um, announce that they would help develop um, the capability for decentralized identity um, so that you know, citizens, customers, patients, students could begin to have greater control over their um, identity and how that might connect into an identity access management system when um, procuring whether or not it's health services, education services. And so we have the four giants, Amazon, Facebook, Apple and Microsoft, taking very different perspectives around the data, which obviously reflect their business models. Um, we have Facebook having just made the decision to bring 1.5 billion customers out of their European data cloud um, infrastructure and move it to the United States. Um, and so they've obviously sat down and looked at the cost, potential cost of compliance or the regulatory environment and the privacy requirements in Europe versus the United States and made a very, very clear decision about where they want that data. Um, and so I think for the C-suite to summarize, it's what's the strategy, what's the business model, and therefore is regulation something that you built in from a compliance-led point of view, or is it something that actually enables you to differentiate um, in terms of whatever product or service you offer? Yeah, and I think it's. I think that's that's core to it. It's in other words, is there a value that I'm going to be able to create if I'm able to protect people's data? You know, that's beyond just kind of simple compliance with the regulations. Um, and I think there's different kind of attitudes based on where the companies are located. I noticed that in Europe and outside the United States, um, they put up more of a premium on data privacy, and that they they seem to want to invest in it just to ensure that if they are moving in the cloud or leveraging other other technology that, you know, IoT based systems are, are a good instance of that, uh, that they're not going to run afoul of data privacy issues just because it's such a sensitive topic. Uh, in Europe, for example, they're very suspicious of Google and Facebook and, you know, a lot of the things we kind of take for granted here in the States, where in the United States, it's typically going to be a discussion of how cheaply can I protect my data and my customers data and how are you going to keep me out of the papers? So what's the minimal amount of money to, to, to go ahead and make that happen? And by the way, I want to be compliant with the legal issues in certain verticals and sectors I'm in, such as HIPAA and, you know, the, the retail stuff and the accounting stuff. And we rerun against that stuff all day. But at the end of the day, uh, privacy becomes kind of a cost line item. Uh, and I always advise them that it shouldn't be. It really should be something that's systemic to each and everything you do. But the reality is, is that we love to break things out and we love to kind of make it a line item. And by the way, it may get cut, you know, as soon as there's some kind of pressure on the business, which is it's just concerning as well, because guess what? If they run a breach or basically a breach happens and they lose data, um, I look at very, you know, companies that are, you know, having trouble already that aren't spending money on the security that they need, you know, going down just because of the death of a thousand cuts in terms of the bad PR they're gonna get. So, yeah. so it really is kind of a trade-off. It really comes down to the culture of the company and the culture of the C-suites. Um, and like I said, it, uh, in in my world, it has a tendency to be more cost versus risk versus uh, uh, versus benefit. And that's kind of the way it, it, it's looked at, not necessarily uh, a moral issue, which it kind of should be, you know, but a cost issue. Yeah, and I think the culture piece, David, is really important because, um, you know, that's an easy one to overlook when cost is at play. Um, but as you say, you, you, where if, if there is pressure on from, say, shareholder return and the pressure goes to, OK, what can we cut? And those corners are cut around, say, for instance, privacy or the regulatory edges. Um, often people are under underestimate what a breach like that ends up costing, not just in financial terms, but overall the culture of the organization. What does that do for attracting talent in the future? What does that do to existing talent? What does that do if in a C-suite you already have tension around, say, strategy and business model? 
um, those kinds of decisions end up reflecting on everyone in the C-suite and everyone at the board level. And so, so I, I think, you know, we've, we've known about things like GDPR, we've known about the changes to open banking. Certainly from, from Miko's point of view, we've been talking to potential customers and partners for the last 18 months, two years. And it's, it's kind of like, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's 2018, that's 2019. And the thing is, we're here now. We'll blink and it's 2020. And that leaves a relatively short period of time for C-suite to sit down and say, you know, what does the next decade look like? And if we had, you know, our top five core values as an organization that drive our business decisions, where does privacy, where does data collection, where does security, where does data protection sit in those set of values? And, and, and what is the long-term story that helps our shareholders trust where we're going, but more importantly, ensure that we can be trusted, you know, by the customers or services that we offer? I, I think that's a great point. And I think it comes down to, um, you know, consideration of long-term strategic needs of the business, the value that they're, they're placing on the privacy of their customers. Uh, their ability to, in essence, do their job in a long-term way, also the ability to assimilate into new technology, you know, cloud computing being the main thing. So we were carrying privacy into the cloud where you don't necessarily own the infrastructure. And as long as we have the processes and technology, we're able to, you know, to keep things fairly secure, probably more secure than on-premise. If you notice that the big breaches are always around the on-premise systems, clouds are nowhere near them. Um, so it is going to take a, con a constant investment from the C-suites. It is going to take kind of a change in attitude and their value to privacy and really kind of understanding that if they don't, they're not able to provide the privacy that the, their customers need, employees need, and the company needs, uh, then they're ultimately they're going to just, just plan on failing. They, they might as well exit the market because I think it's going to be uh, one event, two events, and they're going to be gone. Yeah, I, I agree, David. And I think the other thing is, is the last decade, as everyone raced to sort of the promise of big data and cloud, um, there was this, uh, you know, there was this um, desire to have as much data as possible. And so there was this over collection of data from customers, from patients, from employees, because there was just this, you know, we, we need to get our hands on everything we can. I think what we're going to see for the next decade is the flip side of that, which is, are we collecting too much data and is our over collection what is creating the vulnerability where our security vulnerabilities are, you know, where our risks are? And so where, where we've seen sort of the promise of big data, collect everything and then work out what you need to do with it or could do with it later, we, we're going to see the opposite of that saying, okay, what's the strategic reason to collect this and what are we going to do with it and how do we frame that as a genuine value proposition where we can win or earn the trust associated with being able to collect and process that information? Um, and, and I think, you know, that's going to put a lot of strain on marketing. That's going to put a lot of strain on customer identity access management and digital transformation because you have a nexus of those competing um, requirements that really need to come together in the same room and say, okay, What's the architecture of our business model? What's the value proposition? And therefore, how do we earn the right to collect and process this information? Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, I agree with that 100%. And, and Dave, do you have any final thoughts uh, before we close the show out? No, I like what Gina said it very well. I mean, ultimately there has to be some good advice and some ways in which we move at this with best practices. And so we're starting to figure those out, um, but, but I am having some, some rather uh, you know, uncomfortable discussions with, with C-suite, you know, people at the C-suite who are, you know, considering the trade-off of data privacy and cost. And I, I think it ultimately, you got to be able to do data privacy as economically as you can, uh, but you're not going to be able to avoid it. You're not going to be able to avoid the cost. So let's get over it and move on and be good at what we do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, look, thanks very much, uh, guys, for being part of the show. Katrina, it's been a, it's wonderful having you on our uh, special guest uh, for the shows this week. Thank you, Brad. It's been really lovely to join the conversation. And uh, thank you, David. Great questions. Always a pleasure. 
Thanks, Dave. Thanks for being part of the show as always. It's, a, it's a, an absolute pleasure having you on board. And thanks for watching, everyone. We hope you enjoyed watching this week's shows. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe to them so you don't miss out on any future shows. You can reach hold of Katrina on Twitter, which is at Katrina Dow, which is Katrina with a Y. David's on Twitter as well, which is at David Lindicum, and myself on Twitter, which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard. Thanks for watching, and remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share these videos.